Hi, and welcome to the third video in our study of Centerpiece by Harry Sweets Edison. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the melody. So I want you to open up a copy of the lead sheet of this piece. Now, when we study this piece, what we find is that there are a lot of notes on the page. However, there's a lot of repetition, which makes our lives quite easy when it comes to learning the actual melody. What we have in melody one, which is 12 bars, like all of our blues, 12 bar structure, is the same phrase repeated three times. And it sounds like this. Now, if you take that first phrase, there's also quite a lot of repetition in within that phrase. And in fact, the idea of question and answer, which is something that occurs so much in music, and in fact, something that we did in the previous video, is really relevant here, because we have one phrase. And then that phrase is repeated. And then the very end of it is changed. So even within that first phrase, there's only about one and a half bars worth of notes to learn. But the most important thing is to work out a way in which we can play it so it fits within our swing groove. And we'll talk about that a bit more later in this video. But looking ahead, let's look at melody two now. And what you'll find in melody two is again, there's a lot of repetition. In fact, the first half of the melody is exactly the same as it was in melody one. But the second half notes, the notes are the same as the second half in melody one, yet for the second half of it, we have something called off beats. So all of the notes are displaced and pushed backwards a little bit. And so it sounds like this. Now that's quite a difficult thing to do playing off beats and it can be quite easy to get lost or end up on the beat instead of off the beat. So if this is something you're struggling with, what I would suggest you do is make sure you tap on the beat and then it's easy to play it off the beat. So if you're playing an instrument that requires your hands, you would tap with your foot or if you're playing something with your with one hand, you could tap with the other hand. So if I played that that half of the melody again, and just tapped on my chest. You can see how every time I tap, I'm playing in the space between my taps. Like that. So again, if you're struggling with the second half of the melody, this is how I would approach it. The next thing to notice is on this worksheet, I have written in some articulation marks just to help you with your phrasing of the melody. Now, there are two types of articulation that I've written on this page. One is what we call a hat accent, which looks like that on top of a note. Um, in jazz music and in big band music, when we see a hat accent, what we mean is a, quite a short, detached, sharp note. So make sure when you see a crotchet or quarter note or any note that has a hat on it, that you make it quite punchy and quite short. And then the opposite is to be said for the notes with a line over the top, which is a legato line, which means play the note for its full value. Now, in fact, when we play swing quavers and when we play swing music, I would say that the standard articulation is to play each note as fully as you can, unless you make the choice to play a note specifically short or there is an accent that tells you to. So in this piece, I would be playing all of the notes long except for the hat accents. And those legato lines are just to remind me to really play those off beats as long as I can, which also helps me not to rush them and land on the beat as well. Going back to the idea of swing quavers, which is something we spoke about in the previous video and also I mentioned earlier in this video, it's all it's really important to keep that sense of the triplet in your head do la do la do la do. So when I'm playing this melody, I'm always singing that. Ba do da do da do da do da. 
Ba doodle da doodle da do do da, and that helps me really slot all of my quavers into the right places, as well as making sure, of course, that I'm listening to my drummer, who's giving me those swing quavers as well. The final thing to note about this lead sheet is the geography of it, how we go about playing it as a whole piece. So you, what you'll see on the second to last line on the first page is what looks like a first time bar sign. And at the end of it, it says the words to improvising. So after you play that whole page, which is two choruses of the blues, two 12 bar forms of the blues, we go on to do some improvising, which we will be discussing in more detail in the next lesson. Um, and then when we come back after doing the improvising to play the melody, this time we play the whole melody through up until the end of bar 23. And instead of playing the first bracketed section, we jump to the last line and play the last bracketed section to finish the piece. So that's all the information you should need to have a go at playing this melody. So here's a version of me playing the whole melody to give you an idea of what it all sounds like. And then it's going to be your job to go away and practice this so that you can do it as well. you enjoy playing this melody as much as I do. I find it a really great melody to practice my swing quavers and it's a really satisfying one to play. In the next video we're going to be looking at improvising in a lot more detail so we're going to be seeing how we can use different notes and different rhythms to create some interesting improvisations.